This week on The West Block. The opposition probe more deeply into the Wii controversy. There's been a lot of contradictions through this saga. There are so many smoking guns in this Wii scandal. I mean, you could smoke a brisket in the Liberal cabinet room. Oh, how did we think it was authorized to start implementing a government program if no one in the government had authorized you to do so? So that's a question that I cannot respond to. Threats against politicians. This isn't an isolated incident. Uh, it's not just involving me. Too often there are incidents against politicians, often female politicians. And COVID reopening concerns. Modeling for BC shows the province is trending toward massive growth of new cases in September. The government is still under fire over the wee controversy here in Ottawa. All this amid calls for Bill Morneau, the finance minister, to resign and threats against politicians as they try to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me now to talk about all of this is Infrastructure Minister Catherine McKenna. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us, Minister. Uh, you know, there was a video that was very disturbing of you being harassed and abused on social media this week. It's really raised the question about the threats that politicians are facing. Some people are saying this is all going to end with somebody being seriously injured or killed. How serious do you think these threats are to people in political life? Uh, look, I have now heard from so many women about incidents that they have faced, uh, even in Ottawa. So this past week, we had uh, a councillor, Laura Dudas, a uh, brick was thrown through a window, Lisa McLeod, uh, an incident involving her car or tires um, it being slashed. Um, and then this incident, which actually wasn't even me, it was one of my core staff members, a new young female staff member opens the door to some you know, man hurling abuses at her. And, and there's many other examples. And I think that we do need to take it seriously. Well, and we do want to talk to you about your job, too, because it's unfortunate that, that we're in this position of having to talk about you being threatened, about women in the public eye being threatened. You're here to do a job, and that job is infrastructure. And that's a particularly important topic for a lot of people during the pandemic. I'm curious to know if you're going to be putting a significant amount of infrastructure money towards, for example, the provinces and cities to try to help them create jobs to rebuild after the pandemic out of your portfolio. Well, first of all, let's be clear what uh, what I've been focused on with my department. We've been approving hundreds of projects um, across the country, creating thousands, uh, tens of thousands of jobs um, in a whole range of areas from public transit uh, to renewable energy to cycling paths uh, to community culture and rec centers, all of the things that are really important. Uh, just last week, I announced a new COVID-19 resilience stream where province Provinces could uh, focus on things uh, that need to be done, uh, such as making schools safer. I know a lot of parents are worried about kids going back to school, uh, retrofitting healthcare facilities uh, for both elderly people, but also the workers um, and visitors so people could stay safe, uh, where, the province, where the federal government would put in a, a higher share, and these would be projects approved quickly. On the WE Charity, this is a controversy that continues to rage. This week, WE actually registered to lobby. They hadn't done that before. Your government has said uh, that essentially it was a mistake the way that you went forward with giving this $900 million program to WE. There seems to have been a lot of information that was out there that WE was potentially problematic, whether it was charity intelligence or journalists reporting. Yet, your government sat around the cabinet table and made the decision to hand this project over. It's now been cancelled, which has left thousands of young people People in a lurch. Some Canadians are questioning whether your government can continue to govern during the pandemic and manage large spending programs given the performance on the WE file. What do you say to them? Uh, well, like, look, obviously lessons are, you know, learned from, you know, the, the WE incident. But when I talk to Canadians, when I talk to, you know, people who live in my riding of Ottawa Centre, uh, they recognize that you know, the programs that a lot of the programs that have been instituted made a huge difference. In fact, whether or not that they can pay their bills or their businesses can stay open. So whether it is CERB, uh, which has managed to keep many families uh, and people afloat, uh, or it's the wage subsidy program that are keeping people employed and businesses going. I mean, those are really important programs. Were some mistakes made from we? Yes. And there's been, there's committee hearings and other, you know, uh, 
you know, other initiatives to get to the bottom of that. We just have a few seconds left, but on the transparency file, will your government be more transparent when it comes to infrastructure projects? Because the parliamentary budget officer has said he couldn't account for the spending on 20,000 of the projects so far. If there's more to come, will you increase your transparency there? Uh, so I want to be 100% clear on this because I think there's a lot of misinformation, including misinformation online. Parliamentary budget officers acknowledge that all the projects are there, all the money has been accounted for. Um, it can be a challenge with certain programs when you're dealing with like the CMHC and mortgages and funding to uh, centers for you know women uh, and, or money that goes directly from municipalities um, that flows directly to them and there isn't a reporting obligation from the province. But all those money, all the projects are there. The money has been invested. We've been working extraordinarily hard with our public service to approve thousands of projects, creating jobs across the country um, and really improving communities. And we're going to continue doing that. That is my commitment. And we will do that in a transparent way. You can go to a map right now, see where the projects are, see what uh, investments have been made to improve lives and communities. And that is what I wake up every day doing. How do we build a better Canada for now? And how do we build a better Canada for the future? Okay, that's all the time we have. But thank you so much for joining me, Minister. We appreciate it. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, it looks like my last question period as leader of the Conservative Party is, is just like my first. Warm, sunny, and the Prime Minister nowhere to be found. <laughs> That was Andrew Scheer on his final day in the House of Commons as opposition leader. Joining me now to talk about who will replace Andrew Scheer is one of the leadership candidates themselves, Aaron O'Toole. Aaron, thanks for coming back on the show. Good to be with you. So, Aaron, I think the big question on everyone's mind right now after what happened with the bloc leader this week saying he'd call an election is if you become the conservative leader, are you willing to go to the polls in the fall during a pandemic? Well, the first thing I'll do is consult my caucus. I, I'm a current MP, so I've been involved in all the debates, all our meetings. But as leader, I'm going to talk to them to hear about what's going on around the country, where the economic recovery is not going well. That's going to be our focus, as well as holding the Trudeau government to account. The scandals are piling up faster than we can even write the stories, Mercedes. So we're going to hold them to account. The bloc can't form government, but the Conservatives will. So we will take the lead when Parliament returns in September. I know that Elections Canada is currently conducting a review of how to safely carry out an election during a pandemic. Would you commit to waiting until that review is complete and you have scientific advice before committing to go to the polls? Well, my children are going to be going to school like thousands and millions of Canadian families shortly. And in recent years, we've had more advanced polling Mercedes. So this is not rocket science. This can be done safely and effectively, and it will be. Are you concerned about trying to bring down government at this time, not only from a health perspective, but just from a political one? I mean, this is a government that has been spending a lot of money with very popular programs. Conservatives, uh, known for being a little more fiscally austere, would you continue to spend the same kind of money and keep the same programs alive that the Liberal government has implemented? Uh, and do you think that Canadians are ready to hand the reins to you when right now they have a secure source of income? Yes, they are, because they know the future is grim. We've seen investment fleeing Canada, Mercedes. The trouble is, is when the CERB is wound down, we need jobs. And the Trudeau government's driven them away in the oil sector, forestry, manufacturing here in Ontario, tariffs on us again. They've mishandled literally every trade and important foreign relation we have. Canadians know we need a serious prime minister. Again, I'm going to offer that from my business experience, cabinet experience, military experience. I'm in it for Canadians. Justin Trudeau's clearly in it for himself, his family, and Liberal insiders, and I think Canadians are sick of it. You know, Aaron, but there are people who are receiving that CERB check who are feeling pretty confident that as long as the Liberals are in power, at least they have that. What would your alternative be in terms of an economic recovery? It's great to talk about job creation, but that takes time. There's people who won't have jobs in the meantime. The, the, the CERB needs to be wound down in a, in a way that's just Mercedes. But there are thousands of jobs going unfilled because people are being paid not to work. So we are actually shifting the narrative here from people having the opportunity to provide for their family in Canada through their work and entrepreneurship and, and getting out there and working or depending on government. I think the vast majority of Canadians want a chance to work, provide for their families. We need 
jobs. We need the economy to be moving. And people know that we can't spend almost a quarter of a trillion dollars in half a year without there need to be some discipline. So we're going to be fair, Mercedes, but Canadians know what Justin Trudeau is doing is putting old age security, putting health care and putting the future at risk. Aaron, we just have a few moments left, obviously, Conservative leadership wrapping up. We will know who the new leader is uh, just over a week from now, Sunday night, next Sunday night. What do you think the biggest high point of your campaign has been and what was your biggest mistake? I think our high point was we were a month and a half ahead of the government on a plan for COVID-19. In fact, I was talking about getting the EI system stood up to avoid the problems we've seen with the CERB. We asked for the border to be shut. People saw that a campaign team with limited funds and money was a month ahead of the federal government with everything they had at their fingertips. Um, I don't think we've made a mistake. We've been principled. We've been tough, Mercedes. No mistakes. No mistakes. You would you would be pointing them out if they were mistakes. I, I, I could think of a few that I could highlight, but we we're out of time. So I have to wrap it up there, Aaron. Thanks so much for coming on the show, and uh, we'll see who wins next week. Thank you very much. Look forward to coming back as leader. Each province and territory across Canada has their own approach to reopening schools up after COVID-19. Up next, BC's education minister will tell us what classrooms will look like in his province this fall. September is just around the corner and many Canadian parents are questioning what school will look like for their children with COVID-19 haunting the hallways this fall. BC Education Minister Rob Fleming joins us now to talk about what parents can expect in that province. Welcome to the show, Minister Fleming. Thank you for having me. So you've made the decision to put kids back in schools like many Canadian provinces, but at the same time, BC is seeing rising numbers in cases of COVID-19 once again. Is that giving you any pause to return as planned with the school year? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the leadership we have from the provincial health officer and the daily briefings from our Minister of Health, uh, there's some, you know, some, some tough talk happening here because it's very concentrated in a demographic of 20 to 29 year olds who have uh, really, uh, in some cases, let uh, their responsibility to live within the guidelines uh, slide. There's a lot of partying going on. I don't want to uh, castigate one entire generation because, of course, 20 to 29 year olds are serving us in everything we do uh, that is COVID safe, whether it's banking or essential retail activities and all kinds of jobs. But um, you've, you've heard some admonishments, uh, some stern words and some uh, additional enforcement around some of the things that have led to uh, a, a few uh, episodic uh, outbreaks in British Columbia. Uh, the key to opening schools safely here in British Columbia and every part of the, the country is having a very low transmission rate. Uh, that's the, the number one layer of protection for our communities and for our schools. So obviously that's an effort that all of us in British Columbia, we're all in it together. Uh, are working towards. Uh, we'll hope to see uh, uh, some good numbers and indicators. We'll disclose that on a daily basis as we go forward. Is there any role that you'd like to see the federal government playing here in terms of providing funding or resources for the provinces to be able to do things like renovations on schools or renting additional places so you can get that physical distancing in place? Yeah, I mean, a few things there. We would welcome any uh, federal money uh, that is uh, relief money, stimulus money that would uh, be directed towards uh, school buildings, physical buildings. Also, where they have jurisdiction, which is uh, First Nations on reserve schools that are federally administered. Uh, in terms of additional COVID funding, we've provided a resource package that includes money to hire extra custodians, uh, portable hand washing stations, uh, well stocked supplies. So uh, those sorts of things uh, would be welcome. And I think also this is a great opportunity, not just for British Columbia, but for every province where there exists a digital divide, where rural and remote communities do not have connectivity to support uh, the type of learning that you can do over the internet. Uh, you know, we should as a country uh, vow to have a good high speed internet service for everybody, including those living in rural and remote uh, BC and other parts of Canada and federal leadership and cooperation with the provinces would be more than welcome. We just have a few moments left, but what is your message to education ministers across this country as Canadian children go back to school? 
Yeah, and we had a national roundtable yesterday with my colleagues from the provinces and territories, all of the ministers of education. Everybody is uh, wanting to do this uh, safely. They all have uh, operating guidelines that put safety as the first uh, and foremost priority. Uh, everybody's doing things uh, more similarly than, than, than differently. There are some uh, slight adjustments in different provinces, but um, we're all in this together. Uh, we're all facing the same kinds of uh, social and emotional effects on kids by having a prolonged period. You know, some kids coming back to school this September will have been out of a classroom for over six months. We need a strong restart uh, in the country to to help get kids uh, back together safely learning in the classroom. And it requires, uh, you know, that, that everybody who works in a school uh, be very literate about COVID safety and uh, doing things differently. And that, that includes the kids. So, uh, you know, what we have done with week one of school is really making it an orientation week about what the new normal looks like in schools. And we were able to share our perspective about why we made that adjustment uh, this week with my uh, provincial and territorial counterparts. And we, we got some good ideas from them as well. Great. Well, we have to wrap it up there, but we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Up next, I'll be joined by our journalists on the Hill to talk more about the biggest headlines from this week. You're watching the West Block on Global. As one important voice for Quebec, we observe that this government might not be uh, worthy of our trust anymore. That was Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette last week weighing in on the controversy over we. He says if the finance minister, the prime minister and the prime minister's chief of staff do not resign, the Bloc will do everything in their power to push for a fall election. But how likely is that to really happen? Joining me now to discuss this and more are the Globe and Mail's Ottawa bureau chief, Robert Fife, And here in studio, we have Amanda Connolly, who writes for us at globalnews.ca. Bob, you know, a lot of fluster and bluster from the bloc, but it, it doesn't seem like for all of the howling by opposition parties, there's any real appetite to go to an election. Well, Mercedes, I was always under the impression that the, that the Liberals, if they could, would push a fall election, late fall election, to come off their management of the pandemic. But given the scandal over the WE charity, I think that is completely off the table. The opposition parties are not going to defeat this government right now, despite what Mr. Blanchett is doing. The NDP uh, uh, cannot afford to lose any seats. They have no money. They would definitely lose more seats, it seems to me. The Conservatives will just have an elected leader. They do need to raise more money. And more importantly, they need to get some policy ideas to contrast themselves with the, uh, with the Liberal government. So I think there will be an election, but it'll probably be next year. Well, that gives those of us who are still tired from the last one <laughs> some time to prepare for the next one. But Amanda, we heard a lot this week. There was ongoing testimony. This WE scandal continues. What jumped out from you in all of the committee hearings, and there were a lot this week, as well as the House sitting, that viewers at home would want to know in terms of developments on that front? I think one of the really big takeaways from this week is really the importance of the lobbying registry. Again, you saw through a lot of that testimony at committee, really trying to get to the root of who met who, at what point, what did they discuss, um, what were the kind of specific details going on here that are causing a lot of questions to be asked about how exactly this played out. And of course, when we saw uh, the We Charity register as lobbyists this week, a lot of those details were, um, I guess, verified in a certain way through the registrations made with the lobby register. Bob, there was a lot of questions about not only the Liberal government's future this week, but especially Bill Morneau's. And you broke that story in the Globe and Mail saying that there has been conflict between the Prime Minister's office and the Finance Minister. His future could be in jeopardy. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, uh, this has been going on for some time. As you, we all remember the Prime Minister having to overrule Mr. Morneau on the wage subsidy. He had a 10% that went, went up to 75% when the Prime Minister intervened. Uh, the change in uh, legislation where they wanted to keep Parliament, uh, give the Finance Department unlimited taxing uh, authority until 2021, that blew up in their face. Uh, the whole ethical scandal involving Mr. Uh, Mr. Morneau um, having to pay back money has hurt, has hurt the government's credibility, hurt the minister's credibility, upset people in the Prime Minister's office because they didn't know about this. 
And then that lately they've had a disagreement of, over uh, the new insurance, um, unemployment insurance revamping that's coming down. He, the Prime Minister wants a two-year uh, freeze for uh, for business and Canadians, and Mr. Morneau is pushing for a one-year freeze. So they are looking, as they decide on a cabinet shuffle, who can take care of the next phase of the uh, post-pandemic economy. The Prime Minister is not sure that Bill Morneau was the one. Uh, they had, the names being mentioned, of course, is Mark Carney, the former Bank of England, Bank of Canada governor, who would be a ma major uh, reassurance to the markets if he was to come in. Others, of course, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Chris Freeland and uh, Francois Philip Champagne, the Foreign Affairs Minister. I've also heard the name of the Treasury Board Secretary, Jean-Yves Duclos. Bob, how likely do you think it is that Mark Carney jumps back into the political pool at this point? Or into it for the first time, I should say, not back into it. It kind of feels like he's been there a while, but he's been the Bank of Canada, of course, England governor as well. You know, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I think they would my discussions with senior officials is that if he wanted the job, he'd have the job. Right now, he's serving as an informal advisor to the prime minister. So how would you like to, how would you feel as the finance minister if uh, the prime minister's got a choice between listening to the finance minister or to Mark Carney? Um, I think you would feel a little di bit diminished. I just don't know how long Mr. Morneau can suffer the public humiliation of having his job questioned in this sort of a way. So... Uh, my sense is that we'll have a good idea by September whether Mr. Morneau is going to uh, res re resign on his own to spend more time with his family, Mercedes, or whether he'll be able to hold on to this job. I, I have a feeling that it's going to be hard for him to do so because they're trying to change the page. Well, and, you know, Amanda, we heard that the prime minister's office has full confidence. Of course, we've heard that from other prime minister's offices about other ministers and senior officials before they vanish uh, off the political face of the earth. But one of the other big stories this week that I wanted to talk about with you was the threats against politicians. Uh, Catherine McKenna, uh, who is the infrastructure minister we had on the show today, she faced some significant threats. She's faced them under police protection before. So have other politicians. This spans all sides of the spectrum. How have things changed from being critical of politicians' positions to now whether there is actually a potential threat on politicians' lives? I think that's a really good question to be asking right now. Again, you're looking at kind of the the, um, the ways that social media comes together here with um, politics and the way that it's being covered and talked about online. I think that what you're really seeing here is an inability to separate the person from the office and the ideas from the person. And so when you have someone, for example, whose ideas are perhaps more controversial or who are high profile even, uh, individuals who don't support those ideas, who don't think that those are the right direction for the country, they're not necessarily or not showing a willingness at least to recognize that the person who is working on those, you know, you can disagree with ideas, but the person is still a person. And I think that's a real danger to um, to politics, to democracy in any country that, uh, that wants to have and be able to have civilized discourse going forward. And so this is going to be a big issue for, it was a big issue in the last election and will certainly be one for any future election that we do have coming up. Well, I think it's going to be an issue that we unfortunately are going to have to continue to discuss on this show, but we are at a time for today. Thank you both to Bob and Amanda for joining us. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and we'll see you right back here next week at the same time on The West Coast.